These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. King Solomon has died, and the United Kingdom of Israel, believed by many to have been a myth in the first place, no longer exists definitely for sure. Down in the south we have the Kingdom of Judah, which contains within it the city of Jerusalem, the ruling tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and a whole bunch of Levites, and honestly not a whole lot else. Up in the north we have the other ten tribes of Israel. The nation up north is the one now properly called Israel, ruled by the tribe of Ephraim, with most of the best agricultural lands, many of the best trade routes between the Euphrates River and the Phoenician trading ports, and the overwhelming majority of the nation's wealth and population. The king in the north is Jeroboam, son of some nobody, but granted kingship by God himself. And the king in the south is Rehoboam, son of Solomon, grandson of David, the righteous king beloved of God. The amount of things we actually know about this period and these two kings is actually extremely short. In both cases, the focus is almost exclusively on religious matters, with a mention that warfare occurred, and then the most frustrating reference for every historian who's ever tried to read through the Bible. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they're written in the book of Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. And there are similar references to pretty much every other king that gets listed in Kings and Chronicles, although there is actually an assortment of both historical and religious accounts that do get cited in these kind of lines. But of course, the Bible can behold at us all at once. These books are gone, and they cannot be beheld no matter how hard we try. And so, until we get to Ahab, we're going to see some parts of the reigns of these kings, but only from a purely religious lens. And then we just got to figure out what we can figure out past that. Still, we can pick a bit out of the religious aspect of things, starting with Jeroboam. Now, he seems to start out reasonably well-intentioned. He is, after all, blessed by God, don't forget that, and really just trying to save people from whippings and high taxes. I'm in favor of anybody who opposes me getting whipped and heavily taxed. Now, he settles his first capital in the town of Shechem, which is itself a holy city fairly close to a number of holy places, including what the modern Samaritans consider to be the proper temple location, Mount Gerizim. He later moves to a town that is perhaps even more holy, at least in name, the town of Peniel, which literally means the face of God. So we know that he at least is starting out right. He's putting the people first, and he's putting God first. Except you can't actually put two things first. At some point, one of them's going to give. And Jeroboam was sitting in his palace one day, and he realized that his people were going to go to want to go down to that spiffy, nice new temple down in Jerusalem to start doing all their Yahweh worshipping. At least, we're told that this is what he's thinking in an editorial comment, which may be based on some tradition or may just be the conclusion of the narrator. In a properly Yahwistic context, whether or not the strict one temple rule is actually in place at this point, and the very early existence of the Tel Arad temple within walking distance of Jerusalem suggests it might not have been, but still, the fact that there was a big, impressive temple in Jerusalem would likely have attracted worshippers. Doubly so, given the vague references to the pilgrimage festival of Yahweh mentioned previously, 
which may have been a precursor or an early version of the later three pilgrimage festivals that would come to dominate the Jewish ritual calendar. And even though we're told that Rehoboam of Judah was the main instigator in pretty much all the confrontations between the two new kingdoms, Jeroboam isn't so interested in cooperation over religious matters, especially when Rehoboam does hold that trump card of temple attendance over the wealthier northerners. And so, Jeroboam decides he can do a good job looking kingly and at the same time prevent his people from wandering down south and he builds a pair of temples, one north and one south, around a pair of golden bull icons. Now we have seen apostate Yahwists turning to bull and calf images before, and there is reason to think that bull imagery existed in the culture for this god, at least in certain religious traditions. On the other hand, Jeroboam is said to have irritated the Levites so badly that most of them migrate at this point down south to Judah, while Jeroboam starts selecting just whoever to be priest for him without regard for Levitical bloodline. Now is this a case where Jeroboam has started worshipping other gods, and then this disgusted the Levites, and then they leave, and Jeroboam is then forced to select from other people to fill his temples? Or is it that he begins with selecting priests from outside the Levitical class? Perhaps it's a power move, you know, David was rearranging the Levites, why can't I rearrange just priests in general? And the Levites are then upset because they feel that they should have been filling those roles, indicating that these were, in fact, Yahweh temples. Now add to this the fact that no pagan god is mentioned here. Just a few chapters before, we heard of Solomon consorting with specific foreign gods. And later on, we're going to hear a great deal about Baal and Asherah. But here, there's no mention made of any god at all, just the calf idols. Why are the Levites leaving? Why, if they're, they, do they want jobs at these temples and they're not getting them? He also changes the date of a festival, possibly the early version of Sukkot, but that's a later rabbinical tradition from the middle of the seventh month to the middle of the eighth month. Which seems like no big deal, but the Eastern Orthodox and Western Catholic, Catholic Church traditions, they fight over the date of Easter all the time. Now, all in all, though it's described as apostasy and may well have been disapproved of by God, all of this it sounds far more like a denominational dispute than a new or a pagan faith, at least at this point. Changing the dates of holidays, it sounds like the East versus West disputes about the date of Christmas or Easter in modern times. The question of religious icons, well, that came up in the famous iconoclasm debates of the Middle Ages. The question of where is your religious center, well, that recalls the papal concentration of power in Rome and the various opposition to that. Opening up the priesthood from a restricted set to a wider set, that recalls Martin Luther's expansive vision of priesthood. And building additional temples may be justified if you consider the centralization in Deuteronomy no longer valid because God himself has split the Holy Land. That's according to the prophet Ahijah. Jeroboam was approved of by God, as was Rehoboam, as two concurrent separate kings. And so the one temple provision may no longer apply at all. But of course, Despite the modern ecumenical movement, just as there can only be one true religion, there can only be, at most, one true denomination. 
possibly zero, of course, but we're going to assume one at most. And our narrator makes it clear that Jeroboam has chosen the wrong denomination in this case. And so an unnamed prophet who gets called Edo in the rabbinic tradition and Jadon by the Jewish historian Josephus, whoever he is, he shows up to call out Jeroboam and tell him to repent before it's too late. While doing so, the prophet has his own drama. This is the one that gets mauled to death by a lion. But before his death, he does manage to predict the future in quite specific terms. Now, prophecy in general, in general, is mostly more a theological matter than an historical one. But there are a few places, notably Isaiah and Daniel and this guy, whoever his name is, where the predictions get so specific that they rise beyond the level of vague fortune-telling and they start to un affect our historical understanding of things. Prophecy in Scripture, you have to understand, it's not primarily concerned with telling the future. We think about it that way in English a lot of the time, but for the most part, prophets are concerned with telling people about morality, about the consequences of not following God's law, and the sort of exhortations that you're encouraged to follow at church on a regular basis, but with a bit more authority. You know, it's coming from God. Now, the exciting bit of prophet work the healings and telling the future and calling down fire, those all come in the class of miracles, and they're meant to confirm the validity of the prophet's calling. That is, to confirm that you should listen to the moral message because they have supernatural authorization to be telling it. And most of the biblical miracles, they're not so much miracles for miracles' sake, Though, of course, God, who is all-knowing and all-powerful, he can do two things at once. He can get you across a river, and he can tell you that Moses has moral authority at the same time, with the same event. But once we have someone in our narrative who is foretelling the future, now suddenly that becomes a methodological issue for historians. Now, a lot of foretelling even in the Bible, is pretty vague. And we honestly don't have to worry about that stuff. For instance, the bit in Genesis right after the fall, there's, a, there's this prediction that a son of Eve will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will bite his heel, but what that means is honestly super vague. Lots of fulfillments have been suggested. Most often among Christians, it's Jesus did this. But it's even debated whether or not this is actually a prophecy. And so historians don't have to worry about it any more than those neat poetic prophecies that we hear from the ancient Greeks all the time. The idea being that if you don't think it was a valid prophecy, then it was something vague enough that a lot of later events could attach to it, no actual foreknowledge was required here. No actual divine intervention was required. Though, of course, if you have faith, you can see divine intervention in the foretelling and the fulfillment. Now, then there's something a little bit more akin to forecasting. Every election, modern election, Countless would-be prophets flood our newspapers, many with specific election numbers. And of course, they all know the specific date of the election. And some of these are using their understanding of the current situation in the world to make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. And let's be honest, a bunch of them are just guessing. And of course, either way, whatever their methodology, the ones who were right are the ones who more often get remembered. Similarly, there are some popular economists who make their career by predicting a recession every single year. When it doesn't happen, well, that recession, it's still in the future. 
And then when it does happen, well, they're geniuses. They've been calling it for years, don't you know? Now, a good bit of biblical prophecy, let's be honest, it's, it can be read as forecasting. For instance, most of the minor prophets spend a lot of their time there forecasting, oh, there's going to be famines, there's going to be wars, and, and then the bad times, they may have been right just because these things always happen. And then once you have the Assyrians on the horizon forecasting a takeover of Israel, well, that's maybe not so much of a stretch. They were taken over everywhere. But then there is a third category of prophecy. This is the oddly specific stuff. And that gives us an irreconcilable historical split of the sort we haven't seen methodologically up until this point. The particular passage that we're interested in today reads like this. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Now, if you're a person of faith, you probably get chills reading this, for how could the prophet have known the name of a king who would not be born for almost three centuries? Then if you don't believe in God's power, you need to find some rational, secular explanation for how we could have this account of this guy naming this centuries later king by name and making a prediction like this. And let's do be clear, I'm using this story as my example rather than Isaiah or Daniel or some of the other prophecies in Scripture because the ex explanation is actually really simple and uncomplicated, at least as far as these things go. This book was written either during or after the time of King Josiah by someone who knew that Josiah had in fact sacrificed false priests on their false altars. The Book of Kings makes it very clear internally that it is a history written at the tail end of Judahite history, completed eventually during the Babylonian captivity. If any of this particular speech existed in prior histories, the writer of Kings had free reign to insert Josiah's name, possibly not even intending to change the meaning, just to clarify that he knew how the ultimate fulfillment looked. Or, of course, he could have invented the entire thing, creating what's called Vaticanum ex eventu, or a prophetic text after the fact to explain what happened. Now, the meaning of prophecy ex eventu is debated in many different contexts, but it is something we've seen before. When discussing the chief god of Babylon, we encountered the Marduk prophecy, in which the god himself, the god being Marduk himself, explains in prophecy form that three times in the future he will depart from Babylon, corresponding to three times that the cult idol was, in fact, stolen in history. It being the case that almost no one who studies this document believes Marduk to be a real god with power over fate, it is the starting point for most analysis that this document must have been written after all the events described took place. Similarly, the prophecies of Isaiah call out specifically Cyrus the Great of Persia, some two centuries early. So those who do not believe Isaiah's God to be a real God with power over fate, they start with the assumption that at least the second half of Isaiah must have been written later. But then, in reaction to this very attitude, conservative circles begin with the opposite assumption, that there is a real God with power over fate, 
and therefore we assume that the exact opposite is necessarily true in every instance. That is to say, if there was a real God, then this prophecy must have been written in the time literally claimed. It is that must which is a problem here. You see, a real God makes possible the claim of prophecy, but it doesn't validate by itself every claimed instance. Scripture itself does some funny stuff with prophecy. For example, let's just take Matthew chapter 2, where he starts off, the Gospel writer famously cites prophecy that doesn't exist. That's the whole Nazarene thing. He then cites as prophecy Hosea talking about the past. And then he also cites Jeremiah talking about the end of the captivity, which most don't actually think happened in Jesus' day, but either long earlier or in the distant future. And he also talks, cites Micah talking about a son of David born of Bethlehem. Oh, check that box. Who will then go and invade the Assyrians with a giant army. An event which does not subsequently feature anywhere in Matthew's record. I would very much like to see the chapter of Jesus leading an armed group to the Tigris River. I just don't see it in my translation. Anyway, from a Christian perspective, all four of these must be valid prophecies. And there do exist theological justifications for each many of them involving non-linear notions of time and causality, or the idea that time is to some degree cyclical, prophecy having multiple fulfillments, and there existing in history types and shadows of things that will come later. All of which is to say that this entire story of Jeroboam and the unnamed prophet bears many hallmarks of being a parable, a separate episode written in a different style from the surrounding chronicle, more narrative and less descriptive, with things like the inner thoughts of the participants described. Maybe this narrative was originally a reporting from Jeroboam's day. Maybe these exact things happened and they've been put in our scripture. Perhaps it was just completely composed during the time of King Josiah as a justification for these things that he's been doing up in Israel. Perhaps there was an ancient core. Some prophet really did go up to King uh, Jeroboam and say these things, but then it's gotten reworked a little bit to fit the actual events more closely, or just selectively enhanced to make it very, very clear that, yes, this this was predicted, and this is the fulfillment. The sum of it all is, though, that this section cannot be trusted historically. Too many of these events bear the hallmarks of later touches. Even if we believe that God can give specific prophecy. So much of what surrounds the prophecy is clearly being editorialized by a later hand that only through faith in God's word can we trust it theologically, and only by cross-referencing all the facts presented can we trust it historically. Now, of the facts presented, we know that the core idea that northern Israel built idolatrous temples pretty early in its history is supported by later parts of the biblical narrative and tentatively by archaeological investigation. But whether Jeroboam built them, why he built them, we can't answer these because this entire story is in the form of a polemic written by his political and theological opponents specifically to justify a much later invasion where priests were murdered on their own altars. We'll get to that story in a bit. Now, as always, God can do all things 
but also God can and does tell parables for our moral education when that suits him. That's most of what Jesus does. Anyway, we don't know too much more about Jeroboam aside from this. We hear another story about his son dying, which is blamed on his apostasy, and involves his former prophetic supporter Ahijah turning against him. But though I'm sure that this event was, you know, kind of a big deal for Jeroboam, it's not actually a big deal for us. He does have another son named Nadab, who will be our next king in the north. But our story moves down south at this point to Rehoboam, the king of high taxes, sharp whips, and apparently extreme piety, at least at first. You see, in year five of Rehoboam's reign, he's going to get invaded by the Egyptians, and he's going to lose. But both our chronicler and our Deuteronomist are going to have to cover this event due to its significance, and both need to explain such a defeat in terms of punishment by God. That is just the only way they know how to process such a beating. You see, we've already heard that Rehoboam was the more righteous of the two kings, so good that a ton of Levites moved down from Israel into Judah and vigorously defending the primacy of the Jerusalem temple. But now we hear that all of a sudden, the Judahites are building idolatrous temples to foreign gods. In fact, for all that we just heard about Jeroboam's sins, he was building idols that were, let's be honest, probably intended for the correct god. But Rehoboam is probably following his father in unbroken pattern in constructing worship sites that we're explicitly told are for foreign gods. They involved homosexual cult prostitutes, which that's not a slander. We, we know that the Canaanites did that. And we are told that they are more wayward and sinful than the Canaanites who had been there before God sent Joshua to invade. Honestly, the Judahites may have the temple in Jerusalem, which may be currently orthodox, whatever that means, but for the most part, they seem worse than the Israelites that our king's narrator just spent three chapters denouncing. The question is not so much how did things go wrong so fast? But considering that a lot of this likely started during Solomon's reign, the, the real question is whether there was actually any monotheism in Israel or Judah at all. We've asked it in the past, we're going to ask it again. We see one more data point here. Anyway, all this sin brings us to Shishak's invasion. The biblical narrative of sin causing the invasion can be ignored. Whether or not sin was the ultimate cause of the destruction, it's not important historically, as we can trace a few secular factors which give us the very first actual history in this entire series. Now, our story starts down in Egypt. Sometime probably during the reign of King Solomon and Dates on Solomon are pretty fuzzy, but probably the last pharaoh of the 21st dynasty passed away. Now, the entire 21st dynasty was a bit weak. Sometimes they only officially controlled Lower Egypt, that being the northmost part of the country around the Delta. Sometimes they controlled the entire country, but they had a real weak grip on most of the south and were never super impressive as Egyptian dynasties go. And indeed, just calling them a dynasty is a bit fuzzy because we're not 100% sure that all these pharaohs were actually descended from each other instead of it just being a bunch of usurpers. Anyway, the final king of that dynasty had a general named Shoshank, a Libyan who through complicated things, had blood ties to the royal line. Seeing the kingly vacancy, now that 
king of Egypt is dead, Shoshank uses his army to take control of the country, and he proves to be a fairly vigorous and expansionist king. Now this Shoshank is pretty probably Shishak from the Bible. There are linguistic considerations in making this match, as well as people who don't think that Rehoboam existed, or people who think Rehoboam existed in a different time period. But this is our first kind of commonly accepted synchronism between biblical accounts and wider recorded history. This, by itself, isn't enough to hang specific years on, and it's not quite as strong as we'd like it to be, but it, it is enough to tell us that Rehoboam, and by extension Jeroboam, are late 10th century figures. Shoshank himself is poorly documented relative to other Egyptian kings, and his deb dates are also debated, but when we're talking about debates in Shoshank's reign, we're talking a matter of maybe five years on either end of 940 and 920. Not these existential questions that we've faced with most biblical figures. Shoshank definitely existed in the 20 years from about 940 to 920 BC. There's plenty of debate around that, but we can all agree on that. One of the things we don't hear from an Egyptian perspective is anything about Jeroboam. But in all fairness, that isn't too surprising. Jeroboam does claim to have a wife from Egyptian nobility, and thus implicitly some sort of treaty with Shoshank. But a minor treaty from a minor power is easy enough to miss archaeologically. We also don't hear anything from Egypt about Judah as a kingdom or Rehoboam as a king. Turning back to the Bible, we also don't hear very much about the significant warfare that was going on between Judah and Israel at this point. We get a brief mention that, uh, yeah, warfare was continuous throughout this period, even into the successors of each king. But our main mention here is the story about how Rehoboam was prevented from starting a war because of the word of God's prophet. The general guess is that the understated mention of continual warfare is underselling things a bit, as there does seem to be a general state of conflict, at least at the level of border raiding, between the two nations for much of their history and a peaceful separation of nations is pretty much unheard of historically prior to the decolonization fad of the modern era. It may be that this fighting is part of what motivated Pharaoh Shoshank to come and invade Judah. Indeed, it may have been the initial backing of the Egyptians more than that prophet of God that kept Rehoboam's army home in the first place. Now, I should stress that Pharaoh isn't setting down all his pharaonic tasks because he really loves Jeroboam and just wants to defend him at all costs. He's not like a big pro-Israel, anti-Judah guy. If there is an element of the Pharaoh getting involved, maybe because of this royal marriage, maybe just out of geopolitical considerations... It's, at best, it's all a pretext for war. Because Shoshank is building his dynasty on the back of a military expansion. And the reality of Egyptian geography is that if a king of the Nile wants to go around invading things, he's probably going to pass through Judah at some point. But also, if this is what's happening, then it means that northern Israel may have been essentially founded as an Egyptian puppet state, which isn't the most radical of notions because they are going to have a sort of on and off relationship with Egypt diplomatically for much of their later history, while Judah in turn is going to be on and off aligned with the Assyrians, but those are generalizations. We're going to flesh them all out when we get into the later history. Anyway, we may be wrong about all this Egyptian connection stuff, but we are 
pretty certain that Pharaoh Shoshank did attack. And because of the synchronisms, we can give our pretty first, our first pretty confident date in this entire Israel series. The attack was somewhere around 925 BCE. We, of course, have the biblical mention, which is short on details, but over in Egypt, we have something called the Bubastite Portal, a decorated doorway in the Karnak Temple Complex, which is inscribed in commemoration of this campaign, including a listing of cities that the Pharaoh took plunder from in this campaign. Now, it is heavily damaged in places. We can't read every city name that we, in, where we know that there should be city names, but we don't see the name Jerusalem on the list of cities, though it could well be in the damaged sections. If we can ever reconstruct that, it would be fantastic. And we don't see mention of Israel, Judah, Rehoboam, or Jeroboam, which is a bit disappointing. But we don't see any kings listed in there at all for this region. We don't see any nations named in particular. So maybe they're in the damaged portion. Maybe they were just beneath the Pharaoh's notice. But among the list of cities are many which are Judahite, as well as some which are generally Canaanite. Though the question of exactly which cities fall in the control of which Canaanite power at this time is a bit fuzzy, outside, you know, the very biggest of towns. And in fact, this gets us to our biggest problem with interpreting Shishak's campaign. The Egyptian source gives us a list of cities, and our Jewish source tells us that Judah was attacked. In fact, our Jewish source uses the invasion as an almost purely theological exercise, and our Egyptian source is concerned with pretty much nothing more than the glory of victory and the quantity of plunder. What we don't have in this context is a good sense of the borders of Israel or Judah at this time. Now, some have assumed that the two kingdoms split along literal tribal lines, as we get the, the tribes described in Joshua and a couple other places. That pretty much the moment Jeroboam walks north, the fullness of ten tribes and all their associated territory cleanly splits off with him. This picture leaves two relatively small states surrounded by a number of other smallish peoples most of whom now have a good reason to hate Israel and Judah for having recently been conquered by them or their predecessor state. We don't hear anything about these other nations breaking free, but that is pretty standard. Ancient history hates recording defeats, and the transition out of a sphere of influence can sometimes be kind of a subtle thing, not a hard, easily demarkable shift. We can call this the minimalist view of Judah's territory, in that it's the smallest possible Judah, just the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and nothing else. But there is another view, which we can call the maximalist view of Judah's territory. Now, both would agree that the picture I just painted a moment ago definitely characterizes the region for most of the next two centuries, two small kingdoms, plus some other also small kingdoms. Plus or minus, of course, the standard shifting around as wars and raids and politics changes things. However, in the maximalist view, one might question just how neat and clean the Israel-Judah split actually was. Jeroboam has been out of the country for a while, and he just came back, and from Egypt of all places. Rehoboam holds the capital and the throne, and there's a brand new temple there, which some think was a really big deal. And it is exceedingly rare for 100% of a people in a region to all back the same side in a civil war like this. And don't forget, 
even though some of David's conquests were lost under Solomon and more may have silently slipped away when Solomon died, some places outside the 12 tribes' regions are likely still under Israelite control as Rehoboam takes the throne, including towns like Gath and some areas across the Jordan. We hear about pretty significant population movements in the first five years after the split, and we hear mixed reports about whether or not there was a major war, indicating that the two kingdoms may have been much more equal in power than the usual view of ten tribes versus only two would suggest. What I'm saying is that there's a way to read this where Judah, at the time of the split, is massively swollen up beyond what we normally think of it as, still controlling Philistine towns, maybe holding what we would think of as Israelite towns up in the Jezreel Valley, uh, holding towns across the Jordan. Now maybe these are still mixed in with towns that have declared for Jeroboam. There may not have been a clean line anywhere between one place and the other. It has, after all, only been five years, and news moves slow in this era. The breakup is political. It hasn't been, as far as we know, enforced by a military conquest, where, you know, the conquest ends where your last soldier stepped. If we take a maximalist view, then nearly every town that we read about in the Bubastite portal that is, the towns that Pharaoh Shoshank listed as having attacked, every one of them, almost every one of them, could have been Judahite or Judah-aligned. The Pharaoh could have been supporting his tiny allied state of Israel. He could have been attacking a significant regional power during a moment of weakness to keep Israel from reforming back into its former size, preventing Judah from re-swallowing Jeroboam's kingdom. Or he could have just been picking Judah as the best source of plunder, having itself spent three generations collecting all the best plunder from the rest of the region. In this view, it's only after Shishak's invasion that Judah becomes relatively tiny and that the separation between the two kingdoms becomes an enforced geopolitical fact and that towns like Gath regain their independence and the borders settle into their more accustomed configuration. Note that Peniel is listed on the Bubastite portal as a place that got attacked which may be why Jeroboam subsequently moved his capital, since maybe he had always wanted it in Peniel for whatever reason. It's a nice holy town, but maybe he didn't control it for the first couple of years. Not until Shishak came, uh, busted it up a little bit, maybe Shishak gave it to Israel, or maybe Jeroboam just comes in to the wreckage and says, oh, look at this nice town. I guess it's mine now. Now, in, this, in the minimalist view, that's the maximalist view, in the minimalist view, this campaign looks a little bit different. In this view, the Egyptian king attacks basically for no reason at all, aside, of course, from his own power and plunder lust. What he finds in Canaan is a bunch of tiny states, none of which he cares about, and he takes minimal notice of them, sending his army from town to town. He likely doesn't need to actually attack most of the towns, though he surely does a fair bit of violence just to show he's serious, and he collects plunder wherever he likes, from whoever he likes, with no one in this divided region able to unite and put up any kind of front. Everyone, Israel, Judah, the Phoenicians, the Philistines, the, all the minor states, Edomites, Moabites, uh, Ammonites, they all pay a little bit of tribute. And then the Pharaoh leaves with the region poorer, but not much changed by the intervention. I should say that both of these readings seem to me to be theologically sound. Neither of these is really a skeptical view, which would be that uh, 
Israel and Judah just weren't there. There were just a bunch of scattered towns with no states in the region at all, which would be why no nations get mentioned in the Egyptian records. But leaving aside that fully skeptical view, both minimalist Judah and maximalist Judah seem to be historically supportable for this transition period, this five-year window, and then, of course, the invasion. We can find examples of messy splits throughout history, which is where the maximalist view comes from. We can find examples of destructive and terrifying campaigns that leave very few long-term consequences, which is sort of what the minimalist sees. I personally, I honestly can't decide which seems more plausible here, which is why I present both for your consideration, and of course, as always, mixes of the two are entirely possible. Anyway, whatever was going on during our first historically confirmable biblical event, the end result is something pretty close to the Divided Kingdoms map that you can find up on the Israel Megapost on the OldestStories.net website. Or indeed, basically, this is the map you're going to find pretty much anywhere, with all the caveats that go into all ancient maps. Jerusalem pays a bunch of tribute, and depending on your view, maybe the other kingdoms paid a bunch of tribute too. Rehoboam doesn't accomplish much for the rest of his life, or if he does, indeed, behold, it's recorded in the other records that we don't have. He stuck his sons as governors over all the places that he still controls in order to make sure nothing else slips away. Uh, and he appears to entertain both the Levitical and the polytheist interest groups in his nation. And then he dies to get replaced by his son, whose name is either Abijah or Abijam. That one little difference, though sticks a spear right into the heart of the major questions of this obscure period. We're about to push through a large number of obscure kings in Israel and Judah, mostly in Israel. The Judahite ones tend to last a little bit longer. But for all that we hear very little about most of them, aside from theological evaluations of their piety, the bit we do have has some pretty fun little historical questions compressed into the teeny tiny space of sometimes just one letter. So join us next time as we actually do what we try to do in this episode and run up to our first extra biblical kings, Omri and Ahab. Thank you for listening.